Let's cross now uh, to London and listen in to the British Prime Minister. The largest and most severe package of economic sanctions that Russia has ever seen. With new financial measures, we're taking new powers to target Russian finance, in addition to the banks we've already sanctioned this week. Today, in concert with the United States, we are imposing a full asset freeze on VTB. More broadly, these powers will enable us totally to exclude Russian banks from the UK financial system, which is, of course, by far the largest in Europe, stopping them from accessing sterling and clearing payments through the UK. And with around half of Russia's trade currently in US dollars and sterling, I'm pleased to tell the House that the United States is taking similar measures. These powers will also enable us to ban Russian state and private companies from raising funds in the UK, banning dealing with their securities and making loans to them. We will limit the amount of money that Russian nationals will be able to deposit in their UK bank accounts, and sanctions will also be applied to Belarus for its role in the assault on Ukraine. Overall, we will be imposing asset freezes on more than 100 new entities and individuals, on top of the hundreds that we have already announced. This includes all the major manufacturers that support Putin's war machine. Furthermore, we are also banning Aeroflot from the UK. Next, on top of these financial measures and in full concert with the United States and the EU, we will introduce new trade restrictions and stringent export controls similar to those that they in the US are implementing. We will bring forward new legislation to ban the export of all dual-use items to Russia, including a range of high-end and critical technological equipment and components in sectors including electronics, telecommunications and aerospace. Legislation to implement this will be laid early next week. These trade sanctions will constrain Russia's military, industrial and technological capabilities for years to come. We are bringing forward measures on unexplained wealth orders from the Economic Crime Bill to be introduced before the House rises for Easter. And we will set out further detail before Easter on the range of policies to be included in the full bill in the next session, including on reforms to companies' house and a register of overseas property ownership. We will, we will set up a new dedicated kleptocracy cell in the National Crime Agency to target sanctions evasion and corrupt Russian assets hidden in the UK, and that means oligarchs in London will have nowhere to hide. And Mr Speaker, I know that this House will have great interest in the potential of cutting Russia out from SWIFT. And I can confirm, as I've always said, that nothing is off the table. But for all these measures to be successful, it is vital that we have the unity of our partners, the unity in the G7 and other fora. And, uh, Mr Speaker, Russian investors are all already delivering their verdict on the wisdom of Putin's actions. And so far today, Russian stocks are down by as much as 45 per cent, wiping $250 billion from their value in the biggest one-day decline on record. Sparebank, Russia's biggest lender, is down by as much as 45 per cent, and Gaz Gazprom down by as much as 39 per cent, while the ruble has plummeted to record lows against the dollar. We will continue on a remorseless mission to squeeze Russia from the global economy piece by piece, day by day and week by week. And we will, of course, use Britain's position in every international forum to condemn the onslaught against Ukraine, and we will counter the Kremlin's blizzard of lies and disinformation by telling the truth about Putin's war of choice and his war of aggression. And we will work with our allies on the urgent need to protect other European countries that are not 
members of NATO and who could become targets of Putin's playbook of subversion and aggression. And we will resist any creeping temptation to accept what Putin is doing today as a fait accompli. There can be no creeping normalisation, not now, not in the months to come, not in the years ahead. We must strengthen NATO's defences still further. And so today I called for a meeting of NATO leaders, which will take place tomorrow, and I will be convening the countries that contribute to the Joint Expeditionary Force, which is led by the United Kingdom and comprises both NATO and non-NATO members. Last Saturday, I warned that this invasion would have global economic consequences, and this morning the oil price has risen strongly. The government will do everything possible to safeguard our own people from the repercussions for the cost of living. And of course, we stand ready to protect our country from any threats, including in cyberspace. Above all, the House will realise the hard and heavy truth that we now live in a continent where an expansionist power deploying one of the world's most formidable military machines is trying to redraw the map of Europe in blood and conquer an independent state by force of arms. And it's vital for the safety of every nation that Putin's squalid venture should ultimately fail and be seen to fail. However long it takes, that will be the steadfast and unflinching goal of the United Kingdom. I hope of every member of this House and every one of our great allies, certain that together we have the power and the will to defend the cause of peace and justice as we have always done. And I say to the people of Russia, again, whose president has just authorised an onslaught against a fellow Slavic people, I cannot believe that this horror is being done in your name, or that you really want the pariah status that these actions will bring to the Putin regime. And to our Ukrainian friends, in this moment of agony, I say that we are with you and we are on your side. Your right to choose your own destiny is a right that the United Kingdom and our allies will always defend, and in that spirit, I join you in saying Slava Ukraini and I commend this statement to the House. I now call the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In this dark hour, our thoughts, our solidarity and our resolve are with the Ukrainian people. Invading troops march through their streets, missiles shell their cities, they have been cast into a war through no fault of their own, because Putin fears their freedom and because he knows that no people will choose to live under his bandit rule unless forced to do so at the barrel of a gun. The consequences of Putin's war of aggression will be horrendous and tragic for the people of Ukraine but also for the Russian people, who have been plunged into chaos by a violent elite who have stolen their wealth, stolen their chance of democracy and stolen their future. And we must prepare ourselves for difficulties here. We will face economic pain as we free Europe from dependence on Russian gas and oil and clean our institutions from money stolen from the Russian people. But the British public have always been willing to make sacrifice to defend democracy on our continent, and we will again. The consequences of Putin's actions will be felt throughout the world for years, and I fear for decades to come. Russia's democratic neighbours and every other democracy that lives in the shadow of autocratic power are watching their worst nightmare unfold. So all of us who believe in democracy over dictatorship, in the rule of law over the reign of terror, in freedom 
over the jackboot of tyranny must unite and take a stand. We must support the Ukrainian people in their fight, and we must ensure that Putin fails. Putin will eventually learn the same lesson that European tyrants learned in the last century, that the resolve of the world is harder than... You're watching live remarks from the uh, UK House of Commons, leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, speaking after uh, Bor Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, uh, announced uh, that uh, there would be uh, a range of hard-hitting sanctions, including uh, a f a, uh, Russian banks uh, frozen from the UK financial system. Well, joining us is Douglas Herbert from our International uh, uh, Affairs Desk. Uh, this is... Uh, a taste of what we're going to be hearing perhaps over the next two hours. We're going to hear later it'll be Joe Biden yeah. from the White House. And uh, there's a, that emergency EU summit that's about to begin. Yeah, uh, the sanctions have been the only real, the only bow in, in the quiver right now of NATO and the U.S. and Europe. That and and leaking the intelligence assessments to basically call Putin. Can we, can we say, listening to this already, that it's much stronger than what we saw in 2014 after yeah, the we, annexation of Crimea? We can objectively catch categorically say it's much stronger. But the bigger question is, we have seen that Putin has been impervious to any sanctions pain imposed on him. So the question is, does he really care? Will these financial sanctions bite? Sure they will. What often happens in Russia, and all the times we've gone, been there, reported from Russia, the, the, the paradox is the sanctions end up embittering the Russian people. Uh, making life harder for them, and they turn against, they tend to turn against, they blame the U.S. and Europe. They're not blaming Putin um, and the Russian government for the sanctions, which, you know, presumably would be the goal, because the people, you know, you want them to rise up, right, against a government that has made life so hard and brought on these awful, painful sanctions. But it ends up sort of in a boomerang effect going back to the West. And the other thing you have to remember is, yeah, these are big sanctions. I mean, I, uh, the laundry list includes banning Aeroflot, you know, giant airline which fl flies in and out of London. They even call it Sheremetyevo 2 because there's so many oligarchs going into, into Sheremetyevo on, on Aeroflot. Um, Russia has done a, a remarkable job, and this isn't, you know, positive credit, of sanctions proofing its economy to a certain extent since 2014. It has learned to live with them by growing homegrown and industries. And when you hear when you hear Boris Johnson say there can be no creeping normalization of what's going on, is that also a nod? to effectively what happened back in 2014. Yeah, it, it, it's more than a nod. It's, he explicitly said it because, you know, basically he wants to make people understand that this is a, a rupture moment and that you have to keep in mind every day, you have to be vigilant to the situation there. But when I say, I, I just want to go back to the point, when I talk about sanctions proofing, Russia has become less dependent on the dollar economy. It has done that. We've seen a pivot towards China, trying to strike deals there, try to strike even banking financial system deals there. It has trimmed its budget. It has perhaps more importantly stockpiled a hoard, hundreds, uh, tens of billions of dollars in hard currency and also in gold. And what is the importance of that? The importance of that can be seen on days like this where the ruble right now is going is is going down pretty rapidly. It's been on the ruble and the euro have been uh, have been uh, the ruble has been going down against the dollar and and the euro in the past few days now, which is obviously going to hit Russians pocketbooks. Those hard currency reserves can be tapped into at a time like this to defend the, the, the flagging currency.